So like everybody that's uh, been up here, I've been doing this for almost 15 years now, and I've been in live operations for about 10. So my last big game that I worked on, I was the lead game designer for live operations for Star Wars Galaxy Heroes, hence all the cool Star Wars stuff. Um, so I've been on a lot of different teams. I've consulted for a lot of different teams, and I continue to see a lot of very similar problems. And so uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, designers who come up to me and say, nobody cares about my growth. Uh, designers not going beyond design, being very siloed in their design work. Um, and then friction between live ops teams, right? Designers are these creative people, and then you have monetization, you have data, you have producers, and designers don't want to follow rules, because uh, that's for chumps. So, as the lead designer, my job is to do a couple of things. The first thing is that I am taking care of my design group. I'm figuring out what we're going to do, uh, working with the producers, all this kind of stuff. Hey, what are we putting out? How are we going to put it out? How do I get my designers on board? But I'm responsible for my kitchen. Um, and the first thing I need to do is clean up my kitchen. I need to get those cooks out of the kitchen. And that starts with being decisive in design. One of the problems that I find with a lot of leads and creative directors is that they really want to be open with their design. Um, they want to always say like, oh, wait, wait, I got a better idea and, and I want to build on this or I want to do this thing. And so they don't respect production deadlines. Hey, we need to have these things done. We need to have these decisions made. And so what happens is when you're not decisive about your design, it invites lots of people to come into your kitchen and make decisions for you. Uh, and then you kind of shirk your responsibility in this. So part of the way that I respect these is I empower the people under me. So the reason that I hire a senior content designer is because this guy is supposedly really good at content. I really want to have this person um, making content, informing me about their content. So I'm going to trust them, and I'm going to create a sphere of authority for them. Hey, you're the senior content designer. I'm looking for that feedback from you. Uh, when we make design decisions, when we start to be decisive here, I'm going to ask you, hey, what do you think we should be doing? How should we solve this problem? That doesn't mean I'm going to take everything that they say and, and execute on it, but I'm trusting them and I'm empowering them. And if I don't do that, why did I, why did I hire that person? So then once I've kind of set that up, it now becomes like how, as a lead designer, how do I grow my designers? How do I get them to grow as people and as employees? And again, these are all issues I see. I feel like this is a really cliche talk, but I see this everywhere, and so maybe it's not. Uh, I deal with the issues as they arise. So if I have a designer who is fundamentally failing at a point, I deal with it at that moment. I'll pull them aside, I'll have a chat with them. There's nothing worse than working on a team where somebody pulls you aside and says, you know six weeks ago uh, when you really screwed up and you continued to do it? Well, why didn't you tell me earlier? Um, and I use... I use their failures as an opportunity for growth. One of the things that I tell all my designers, <clears throat> excuse me, is you can't be promoted until you've failed. Uh, and this is really important. It's easy to be successful. It's easy to work on a game like Star Wars and to see that money rolling in and to work on design and feel really good about it. Uh, it's easy to brag to your friends that you're doing a great job on this stuff, but it's really difficult when you have something that you've pushed and it goes out the door and it really craters or uh, you pushed a bunch of bugs out or, or something, you failed. It really highlights their character. Hey, how do you respond when somebody confronts you about your failure? Do you take ownership of it? Um, do you have the humility to want to change and be better? Uh, so it's a really good character, a way to see a person's character. Do your reports know where they stand? Another thing that I always tell my designers is, so long as it is within my uh, ability, you will never be blindsided by me. And that's really important. A designer should always know that when I sit down and talk with them, they either should have seen it coming uh, or it's something that happened very immediately, but they should never they should never have a relationship with me where they think, oh, Daniel's cool and I have this like really great job and it's so cool. And then I pull them aside and be like, you're actually a terrible person and we need to fix that. Uh, that's, that's horrible. And it's really, it, it, it creates this sense of distrust between people. And then this is really important, forgiving and forgetting. When somebody fails and if you're really helping them grow, it's really important to let it go when they've moved past it. The only times I'll ever bring up somebody's failures again are when t in two incidents. One where I'm saying like, hey, dude, you've been killing it. You've like totally made this progress. You're doing really great. It's a way to encourage them, show that they're making growth, show that they're moving forward. And the second is if they continue to make these mistakes and we can't seem to grow them past this, this problem, then we, we would have further conversations about it. But once that's done, 
it's gone. Uh, one incident, I've actually had several leaders who will, will engage in a conversation, and it'll be a difficult conversation, and maybe I'll be pushing hard on something, and they'll bring up something I did in the past, and they'll use it to shift the power dynamic into their favor. And that's extremely, like, how can you ever trust that person? How can you grow with that person? How can you create games with that person when all they're trying to do is make sure that you never forget that you failed and that you, you're under their thumb? So the next problem that we have kind of with designers is designers, designers are very siloed. Uh, and I'm going to pick on systems designers here for a little bit because I love them to death. Uh, but systems designers tend to be very, very into systems design. And they just absolutely love games. They know every game and they know how it works. And they're, gonna, they're like, you talk to them and they're just like, they relate everything to a game, which is great. But does that mean that they're caring about our players? Do they really know who our players are? So one of the things that I do with designers is I set up a test. So I sit, I sit down with them and I say, all right, who do you think our player is? Why do you think they're playing our game? And I have just a, kind of a list of these questions that are, revolve around getting a designer focused on who and why uh, these people are in our game. And I give them about a day or so, write it down, and then I call them into a meeting. There's usually an analyst there or a PM there, and I say, okay, well, let's talk about the things that, who do you think our player is? Who do you think core player is? Who do you think our high value player is? And they answer all these things, and then I'll usually have the PM do a little presentation of like, well, here's actually who this player is, because it's really important. This is not our game. The minute we built it and we put it out the door, it's the player's game. We're not building this thing for ourselves, and there are so many designers who look at this and go like, this would be really cool, I would really like this thing. But the reality is, is that our players wouldn't, and our metrics don't support that, our data doesn't support that, our community doesn't support that, and so you see a lot of features go out the door or a lot of live events go out the door that are focused on the designer and not the player. Um, so. If I, can get player, if I can get the designers to start thinking about the players and not themselves, to be dungeon masters and go like, I have this really cool tool set. Oh man, how can I make this cool thing that people will interact with? Um, I want to give my designers opportunities to get recognized. Uh, one of the guys that I work with right now, Roman Zorn, he has a great way of phrasing this, and I'm, I'm totally stealing this from, from a talk he's going to do later uh, in, an, in another conference. And uh, he says, giving oppor uh, designers opportunities to be rock stars. And I really love that. Everybody who becomes a designer wants a moment where they go like, oh, I freaking made that, and people saw it, and they loved it, and that was mine. Another thing that I tell designers is when you're working for me, my goal is, is that should you decide to leave the company, I want you to be able to go to whomever you're interviewing with and on your resume say like, I built this thing and it made $10 million. I built this thing and it increased retention. So giving them a chance to show that they are focused on the player and a chance to do something and be recognized for that thing. Uh, and then the other thing is like, I really, really, really encourage designers to have hobbies outside of gaming. Obviously, I can't enforce this, but it does become a bit of a challenge when you talk to a designer and you say, well, what do you like to do? Oh, I like to play games. Uh, do you like to read anything? Yes, I like to read gaming blogs. Okay, uh, what do you do on your weekends? Oh, I play board games. That's great, but that means that all of your decision making, all of your input, everything that you're thinking about is stuck within the sphere of gaming. You can only do derivative work, um, and it just becomes really hard to encourage designers to start thinking a bit more outside the box. Hey, you know, do you like history? There's a lot of things to draw from there. Do you like literature? There's things to draw from there. So Live is a super diverse team. Um, you know, we've got monetization, PMs, uh, data, production, and design. Like I said, the first three tend to work a bit more um, critically. And what I mean by that is like, hey, monetization, data, there's a lot of established standards, there's practices that you can do, you can follow through with them. I don't want to say they don't require a lot of creativity, they do require a lot of creativity, just in a very different area than, say, design does. And so design tends to be a rabble rouser. Ah, oh, don't tell me what to do, I'm a designer. Uh, and so good design comes from good relationships. I've seen in multiple studios where design doesn't talk with anybody but production, or monetization PMs don't interact with designers. They just come down and say, like, this is what you're doing for economy. These are the packs that we're shipping. This is what we're doing. Data comes up and says, well, these are the numbers, and you're not raising the KPIs, so get, get it together. The best way to get designers to grow and to get them thinking about the players and to stop 
getting them to think about themselves is to start helping build these relationships um, between these teams. I like to try to give people opportunities to come to meetings with me, uh, to interact with the other leads. Again, going back to what I was saying a couple slides ago, having them uh, do that design test where they think about like who is our player, why are they our player, what are they doing, and then getting them in front of the PMs, getting them in front of the analysts, and creating a relationship where I expect every single one of my designers not to come to me and go, oh, is this thing going to move retention? No, you should be going to the PM, you should be going to the analyst saying like, hey, I really want to move retention, I'm thinking these things, can we look at some of our old behavior, do you have insight into current behavior? The other thing is, is that when you get a really good PM, we had a really awesome PM on, on Star Wars, um, you're able to have a conversation with them that allows you and that other individual to think about the player as opposed to the bottom line in a very cold way. It's, it's look, we all, I, I like money, I like making money, I like getting my bonus check, uh, but I really like players as well and I like keeping players in the game and retention is king. So there were conversations that I would have with, with our PM where I would say like, that's really cool, uh, but remember when you used to play Persona and you had these incidents happen and that kind of sucked and it didn't feel that way? And, and he was able to go like, oh man, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, we'll go back and change this or we'll make an update. And then or sometimes he would just tell me like, look, this is coming down from the business. We got to make these things happen. And so it, it gave me the ability to understand where our PMs and our business was, was coming from. And then I could make better design decisions. And I try to encourage that in the team as well. They don't need me. They should be thinking about these things. They should be challenging me as a design lead to say like, Daniel, ah, man, you kind of got caught up in the business aspect. W what about this really cool thing? So leading live ops design, who, who is this person, right? It's being decisive. Um, no decisiveness means nothing but stress and problems for your team and design change and it's super frustrating. Someone who takes ownership. My responsibility is that if my team fails, it is fundamentally my failure. So I'm the one that whose neck is on the line, right? If, if, if an update goes out the door and there were a bunch of bugs in it, that means that means a couple things. Either one, I didn't really check the work that my uh, design team has done, or I didn't, uh, or I did and I let it go out the door. Like there's a lot of problems there, so I take ownership for my team. I'm the first person to to put my neck out because I don't want that. Like I'll do, I'll handle the discipline if discipline needs to happen. I'll handle the growth, um, but. I also need to be responsible as a lead, and I also need to be accountable for it and to show humility because I'm also leading by example through those designers. Um, somebody who's people focused, and this is twofold, right? Obviously, like I was saying before, being people focused on, on the designers, but really being people focused on our players. Um, you know, if I'm not the biggest advocate for the player, if your design lead is not the biggest advocate for the player, why are they leading live ops design? Um, if you are just looking for the title, oh, hey, I want to be the lead game designer, uh, then Live Ops is probably not the place for you. You probably want to do something not related to players um, because everything we do has to start with how do we increase that retention, how do we create better behavior um, with our players, and, and how do we make sure our design isn't wasted, wasted time, <clears throat> right? I don't want to put something out and see my KPIs not even move or worst case scenario go down. And finally, um, it's about building towards retention. So the whole job here, everything that, that I'm focused on, everything that a live lead designer should be focused on is building retention. And again, this is also a twofold thing. I don't want my designers going to my competitor and getting better pay and being treated better and building better games. I want, this, I want that tribal knowledge. I want that excitement. I want these people to aspire to do more inside the studio. Um, so I, I'm building towards retaining those designers and, and improving them and promoting them and creating a, a space where the designers who come and work on our teams go, oh man, dude, I know that Daniel's got my back. I know we're going to be in a good place. Um, and then obviously when, they're, when you're doing that, they're thinking about players. So anyway, that's my quick talk on managing live ops game design. Thank you very much. I, so I'm going to jump in at a question because mm. I, I have, that's why I have the mic. I, yeah. Um, one thing I was thinking about is, have you seen the behavior of your designers change the closer they work with the monetization and the uh, data guys? Yes. 
absolutely that actually improves their thing. oh absolutely because here's the thing one of the biggest problems that designers have it, and because we're an evolving industry live has only been a real thing that we've started really evolving and it's become like so critical to making money like even big time single player pc games have these live services that come on afterwards like as soon as the designer shifts from it's about me i've got this job i'm the designer i'm doing this stuff to oh man i'm really excited to see how the players react with it it's just their work gets better their quality gets better bug counts tend to drop but it's also related very heavily to to that respect design track is so difficult because it's really hard to quantify what a designer does why you would promote them give them growth opportunities and identify their strengths and failures so I think we've struggled to describe what design actually is as a job for a, a long time. Yeah. My friend Todd Kelly keeps describing it as uh, the basically the uh, helping teams not do the wrong thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's kind of the best way to put it up uh, in some ways. Uh, so enough of me. Uh, any questions? Um, cool. And, uh, oh, there's one here. Hi, I'm Christina. Um, not sure how to exactly phrase it. First of all, I love your talk. Um, but I'm curious about how you work through the challenges of um, live ops is one thing. More and more games are also doing the games as a service thing, which also means that the actual development teams keep working on it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I can only assume that Star Wars provides an additional interesting challenge of their license holders and yep. their like leadership people. So um, I feel that there is an inherent challenge between license, uh, between that empowerment, games as a service, live ops, and um, all of that to s prevent silos, clean up the kitchen, sure. still have a good speed and man man uh, manage integrity and so on and so on. How do you go about that? So it goes back to building relationships. I can't control who my boss is. Um, and I can't control my boss's behavior in that I, I don't have an authority to discipline or say, hey, you've done bad or, or um, you're doing great. I mean, I can, uh, I can create relationships with them and work with them to say, hey, I can't stop my producer from trying to come into my kitchen all the time. But what I can do is give them an opportunity to have their input in, and then I'm still directing what actual work is, is happening on that team. So... Um, I, we found that one of the things that worked really well on Star Wars was actually splitting feature and live game design leads because when the design lead tried to oversee the entire scope of Star Wars, it was too big. It meant that I couldn't spend any time with the designers to grow them. I wasn't adequately able to think about the players and look at their metrics because I had to look across all this stuff. So when I was able to kind of focus on live, it actually created a better relationship with the head producer of feature because I was able to say, hey, I see this design you guys are doing. Can we be cognizant of this, this, and this? We are seeing these things happen in live. And once we really fell into that um, uh, cadence of we found really good people who were happy to work together. And look, a lot of it is humility, right? Sometimes somebody comes at you with something, you're just like, I get it, I, I recognize it, it costs me nothing to eat a little bit of crow here and just let you, you know, have some give and take. Because at the end of the day, I'm protecting the players first, I'm protecting the design team second. Um, yeah, go on, let's have one more. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's good, it's good. Um, so working on Star Wars, that's ob obviously getting to be an older title, mm. and you probably have some designers working under you that have been on that project for quite some time, right? Yeah. I'm also on a project where designers have been around forever, and they get very tired of these yeah. projects, right? And I'm wondering how you how you deal with that as a mentor and as a leader on your design team. So I, I actually encourage all of my designers to interview frequently, keep their LinkedIn, LinkedIn updated, um, and to talk to people because it's a couple of things. One, I want them to um, know what's out there. I want them to practice their interviewing skills. Uh, and I want them to see what other people are working on. And there's going to be a couple reasons because I empower them to say like, hey, if you got something cool, like if you're bored or you want to do something, like I can only only do so much. Like I can offer all of these things, but it's but you have to tell me what you want, where you want to go, what you want to be doing. And a lot of times, what we would have happen is a designer would say, "Hey, look, I'm really kind of." 
tired of this aspect of systems design. I'd really like to do this. I'm like, great. It's a great opportunity to move this younger designer into this systems role, allow you, you've, you've paid off. Like, going back to what I was saying, like, give them opportunities to get recognized, to be the rock star. Cool, now it's your time to be a rock star. When we look through that, their, their life cycle as a designer on a team, if there's not several points along the line for them to have the opportunity to be the rock star and to succeed and or fail at that. And then even if they fail, saying like, all right, well, how do we make sure the next time you can be the rock star and then it pays off and you feel that reward? That's how we keep playing. Also, I like to make sure that when compensation comes along, they get stock bonuses, they get paid well, they get recognized for it, and that what I say to them is like, you did such a killer job, this is what it's for, here's what we're going to do next year, I want you to build this thing, and, and so it's about empowering them to, I mean, they're designers, they want to create something, they want to be recognized for that creation. When you don't get recognized for your hard work, and you're working all this grinding over time, and then somebody above you is just complaining, oh, well designed, can't get it together, too many bugs, it's like, that's crappy and people leave like who wants to live in that environment so it's my job to fight that to empower them to encourage them and to to give them opportunities so that management above me goes like oh man you know what your senior designer over here yeah he totally killed it good then i've then i've succeeded and on that note thank you thanks so much